Well, I know it's already been said a few times, but I did want to say a huge happy Mother's Day to all the mums out there. You are all amazing. We all love our mums. Um, I love my mum. Mums are amazing. Um, I don't know what your, mu- your morning has been like, mums. I hope you've had a good start. You've come in for the 11 a.m., so I'm going to assume maybe wrongly, that you've had a little bit of a sleep in. Uh, So good on you if you managed to get a sleep in today. Maybe you got breakfast in bed. That wasn't me, but I am really okay with that because I don't like breakfast in bed. Uh, You might love it. Um, I hate it. And to the point where um, we used to go around and visit my nana and we would have sleepovers at her house with my cousins and my sister and she used to give us her bed to sleep in and she used to go into another bedroom and we would all bunk together in her big bed and then in the morning, I don't know why she did this, but she used to bring in dry wheat bix with butter and honey on it. Now, don't knock it unless you've tried it. It actually tastes amazing. But what I never understood is why she would give that to five kids in her bed like, it's dry wheat bix. Like, you've got to imagine all those crumbs are going to go somewhere and I can guarantee you they weren't going on the plate. And if they started on the plate, they definitely didn't stay on that plate. They were all in her bed and I used to always think, like, that is just a problem that I just don't want to deal with. And so I learned very early on, breakfast in bed, no, no. Not going to have breakfast in bed. But if you like that, I hope that you got that this morning, mums. Um, but maybe you're not aware, we're actually in the middle of a, an emotion series uh, at the moment. And how many of us know that emotions are really important, right? Um, but they can have a really huge impact on our life. And they can actually really take us down a direction, particularly if we don't keep them in check. And maybe they're not leading us in a right, in a right path. Um, so we need to, you know, be careful when it comes to our emotions. But today I'm really happy because... We know it's Mother's Day, but I get to talk to you guys all about joy, which I'm really excited about. And I just think, you know, how perfect on Mother's Day because I think about my kids and they are a great source of joy for me. And if you're a mom or a parent, I hope that you feel the same way about your kids. But how many of us know that they can't be my only source of joy or even the most important source of joy in my life? You know, I think of a time many years ago, we took the kids on a, on a holiday up to Queensland and like most families do, I guess, as you go to the Gold Coast, you think, let's go to a theme park. So um, our kids were young and so we thought, oh, we'll go to SeaWorld because they've got the animals and then they have some rides. And, and our kids were really keen at the time to go on a, a roller coaster or one of those rides and uh, they decided to go on a SpongeBob SquarePants ride. Now, some of you are looking at me like, I don't even know who SpongeBob SquarePants is. That's fine. Um, but essentially, this ride was like a orange submarine. And you hop into the submarine and it kind of like just swung from side to side. Like, it didn't really do much. It wasn't even really like a roller coaster. But what we maybe didn't realise was how much one of our kids was loving the ride until we looked at the footage that was taken afterwards and we had a snapshot of the photo which is going to come up on the screen behind me. And so you'll be able to see. Now I think that this face here must be just the ultimate picture of joy. I just look at that image and not only do I think it's just a beautiful photo, I just think like every time I look at it, it just makes me smile because I think he just looks like he's having the best time ever. Fast forward a few years to just a couple of months ago, we decided to go to Queensland again. And this time we thought, oh, we'll take them to a different theme park. Uh, they all wanted to go on roller coasters again. And so we decided to take them to Dreamworld because we're like, oh, they're all older now. You know, they can go on some of the bigger roller coasters. Um, and I don't know what quite has happened since the moment that we just saw, but um, something has changed in Isaac, and the same thing has actually happened to me too, to be honest. Uh, he now no longer has that same joy-filled emotion from being on roller coasters. In fact, he kind of has the opposite, and instead of the joy that he once felt, it's now been replaced with, I don't know, maybe dread, I don't know. Uh, how can you get me off this ride is probably an accurate depiction of how he's feeling in those moments. And instead, the joy comes when he is firmly planted back on the ground again. So instead of having the joy in the ride, now he's like, yes, finally, I'm back on the ground. Um, And so I think, you know, if we think about Isaac, he was so full of joy on that SpongeBob ride until it stopped. And then he was like, oh, no, like, can we get back on? Like, how can we, how can I get that feeling back? 
And then by the time we got to, to Dreamworld, it was kind of flipped around a little bit. But I think, you know, some people actually live their lives like this. They have joy one moment and then it's gone the next. But what if we didn't have to live like this? What if joy doesn't have to disappear? I want to have that kind of joy. Do you want to have that kind of joy too? You know, and I think most people measure joy by how happy they are. And I actually wonder if this is even the best way or even the only way that we can actually measure what joy is. And as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about joy and trying to figure it out, you know, like, is it an emotion? Is it the, the result of another emotion? And I was kind of thinking, you know, if, if you had to explain what joy was to another person, if you actually had to define it, how would you actually go about doing that? And it wasn't until I was tasked with this that I was like, oh gosh, I don't know. Like, it's actually a little bit harder than, than what you may think. So I went where I think any good person would go. I went to the dictionary and I thought, I wonder what the dictionary has to say about joy. And the dictionary defines joy as the emotion evoked by well-being, success or good fortune or by the prospect of possessing what one desires, a state of happiness, a state or cause of delight. You know, the thing is, the Bible actually has a lot to say about joy as well. If we look in the Old Testament, there's actually about 15 different Greek words that explain or try to explain this idea of joy. And the New Testament has about eight different Greek words. Sorry, did I say Greek before? I meant Hebrew in the Old Testament. Um, and if we look at the, the ESV, joy, rejoice and joyful is actually mentioned 430 times. Whereas if we actually look at happiness, it's only mentioned 10. And it kind of got me thinking, I was like, either joy and happiness are the same thing and so it doesn't really matter that happiness is only mentioned 10 times. <clears throat> or they're actually different and God cares a lot more about joy than he does about happiness. And so I think that this is really fascinating, really interesting because I think most people associate joy with happiness. They, they think that they're just about the same thing. And I think maybe if we dig a little bit deeper, we might discover maybe this is not actually quite the case. You see, joy can be seen as both a feeling, but it can also be considered more of a state of being. And as we look in the Bible, we see joy being associated with feelings and we see joy being associated with actions. And if, when we experience this feeling of joy... <clears throat> It's actually an automatic response to our circumstances. Normally, they're favourable ones. So, the ones that we're generally happy about. You know, we can't force someone to experience joy. Um, they either respond in a way that is joyful or they don't. Okay, and let me explain to you by using an illustration from my childhood. And maybe you can relate. Uh, when I was about seven years old, I really, really wanted a pair of rollerblades. I don't know why, it was just the thing that I really wanted. And so it was the thing that I was like focused on, it was the thing I was talking about. And birthday or Christmas, one of those events, you know, the birthday or the present giving events, one of them was coming up. And it eventually came and I got a gift and it was in a box and I was like, okay, this box looks like it could contain rollerblades. It was about the right way to kind of like, you know, you, you shake it and you're like, it could be rollerblades in here. Anyway, so I open up the present and inside the box was rollerblades. So I was so excited. Like, I was joyful. Like, you can imagine seven-year-old child getting what they've been desiring, right? Like, they are over the moon. And you can imagine my parents, like, they're like, yes, we nailed the present. Like, look how happy they are. Um, they would have been feeling the joy as well. And how many of us know when we give a gift to someone and you nail it, you're like, how joyful do you feel? Like, maybe you felt like that today. Like, you've given a gift to your mum and they're loving it. And you're like, oh, this is the best. Like, look, it feel the joy in the room like so good maybe you were a mum today and you received a gift from your children and you opened it and you're like oh awesome this is great this is exactly what I needed another toaster like what am I going to do with this or 
you're like, oh, great, some rocks from the garden. I didn't know I wanted more of these. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure we've all been in this situation. Like, there is no way that you can fake joy when it's not there. Like, it's either there or it's not there. And you can do your best to try and elicit it when the, the emotion maybe is not quite there, but we all know when the joy is not really being felt. Um, scriptures actually have a lot to say about this as well. And there are many examples where we see this emotion of joy being shown when people are reacting to, to positive things that have happened. You know, reading Matthew 18, the shepherd, he experienced joy when he found lost the lost sheep. The disciples, they rejoiced at the resurrection of Jesus when they were returning to Jerusalem. The church in Antioch, they rejoiced at the reading of the letter from the Jerusalem council that said they no longer had to be circumcised or follow the law. <laughs> they, they were excited. And Paul, you know, he rejoiced many times, but, you know, even at hearing the obedience of the Roman Christians, like, he was rejoicing. And these are only, you know, four examples that I've pulled out, but it is literally everywhere. You can find people showing this emotion of joy as an expression of things that they've experienced, things that have happened. But what do you do when you don't feel joyful? What about circumstances in your life that you're going through where you don't feel like you are having, you know, this emotion of joy? Should you still be joyful? And can you still be joyful? Would you be surprised to know that Scripture actually has quite a bit to talk about this type of joy? the type that is an action that we can be engaged in despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in, regardless of how we feel. And we read in Matthew 5, 11 to 12, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says, Rejoice and be glad. And I think, Jesus, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, do you sometimes read scripture and go, hang on a second, hang on, like, let's rewind, go back just a little bit. Are you telling me that I should be blessed when others revile me and persecute me and say all horrible things against me? And then not only that, that I should be rejoicing and be glad. Sometimes I kind of go, okay. And then Paul, to his followers, he says, not to followers of Jesus, I should say, not his. He says, rejoice always in First Thessalonians. Do you ever stop and think, are there any circumstances that he's maybe left a little bit of room for? And there's not. He just says, rejoice always. It is the shortest scripture in the New Testament. He just says, rejoice always. No room there for any kind of like, oh, but what if this is going on? No, it just says, rejoice always. In James 1, 2 to 3, we read, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. And I just think, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, you're right, it's awesome, but I'm kind of like, count it all as joy when you're meeting trials of various kinds. Like scriptures like this, they actually make me think. They, they get me to stop and think, perhaps the writers had a different perspective than I do. You know, when we're reading that we should rejoice always, that we should count it all as joy when we're, we're facing these kind of scenarios, when, when people are saying things about us and persecuting us, that we should be rejoicing. I think maybe my perspective is, is not quite right. You know, when we see these counterintuitive behaviours happening to what's going on in the natural, I think maybe I need to change how I'm seeing things. Maybe I need to change how I'm thinking. You know, how do you feel when you're coming up against trials? Because I can tell you that I don't always feel joyful. My first reaction isn't always... Gee, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling the joy right now. You know, I know things are looking pretty bleak right now, but, you know, I'm feeling great. Like, man, I'm just feeling the joy. Like, that is not my first reaction. And sometimes it's not my second either, guys. Like, let's be honest, right? Like, it's not the thing that comes to mind first. 
But as I read scripture, I see many passages just like these ones. And there are, there are more. And it seems to me like maybe I need to change how I'm seeing things. You know, as we read through the New Testament in particular, there's one letter that Paul writes that is very focused around joy and that is the letter that he wrote to the Philippians. And this letter is really remarkable for a number of reasons, but one of the main ones to me was that he actually wrote this letter while he was in prison. And he was in prison because he was a Christian. He was just sharing the gospel. Um, He actually hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, he had been in prison at the point of writing this letter for five years. Okay, so it wasn't like he'd just gone in. Like he'd been in there for five years at this point. He had been moved to different locations, um, from moving from Jerusalem to, to Rome. Uh, he actually got shipwrecked to the point that he almost died. So, you know, he's actually been through quite a lot at the point that he's writing this letter to these Philippian churches. And I just think, you know, He's surrounded by so many obstacles to joy. There are so many things that he could be writing about. But he uses the word joy in this letter 16 times in 104 verses. You know, that's, that's quite a lot. That's like more than once per every 10 verses. Like that's, that's a lot of mentions of the word joy. You know, he describes joy. Um, he talks about the joy of following Jesus and persevering for the gospel. And I think, how is he able to do this? Like, how is Paul able to do all of this? You know, and he reveals the main object of his joy in this letter as being Jesus. We read in Philippians 3.1, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And he repeats it again in 4.4 in Philippians. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, obviously, he's talking about rejoicing here, but I think the real key phrase that's in both of these passages is in the Lord. Paul was able to rejoice amid uncertain and unpleasant circumstances that he was facing because his joy wasn't anchored in those circumstances. His joy was anchored in Jesus. His joy was anchored in the salvation that he had, the relationship that he had with God. He had an eternal perspective. You know, Paul had this unshakable confidence in his future salvation. And it's this that I believe completely reframed and transformed his thinking. It helped him to see his circumstances in a completely different way. It helped him to have a deep, and lasting joy despite all the troubles that he was facing. And I think, you know, we need to do the same. We need to find ourselves in Christ because when we are eternally secure in him, it's then that we too can rejoice. You know, as we read through this letter, Paul also draws attention to many of the challenges that they were facing to joy at that time. And the first one's pretty obvious. I mean, he was in prison. But I think... What's imprisoning you right now? You know, Paul was in a physical prison. But but what's imprisoning you? What's making you feel like you're trapped? Maybe it's your financial situation. Maybe maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your health. but, but, But what is it for you? What is it that's presenting a challenge to your joy? He also talks about the opponents to their faith. And I'm sure that we've all experienced this in one way or another. You know, and the Philippians were no different. You know, coming up against people who thought differently to them, people who were vocal about their differing views. You know, not much has really changed in the last, you know, 2,000 years. You know, another, another challenge was their own grumbling. You know, they were complaining about their own circumstances. And I think, like, this can be such an easy trap for us to fall into. Instead of grumbling about what we're going through, we should be handing it over to God. And the last one he mentioned was disunity. You know, them just not working well together. You know, this can look like gossip. It can look like not having a spirit of humility. It can look like not being encouraging to others. It can look like a lot of different things. But it was clear that the Philippians maybe were facing some of the same challenges that we still face today. And the funny thing is, is that Philippi was actually it was a pretty interesting place. Um, they had this 
bit of hierarchical thing going on in terms of their economic status. And so they had these really, really wealthy and powerful people and then they had these really poor people. And so what would happen is, is that these wealthy, powerful people would engage um, in patronage with these not so wealthy people. And what it would do is it would actually create these obligatory relationships. And so what would happen is that everyone then would be all about themselves. Everyone in those relationships would be trying to figure out, what can I do best to serve me? What can I do that's going to be best for my interests? And so it created this, this whole idea of self-service. And this is one of the things that Paul was actually writing to the Philippians about because they were actually going against that trend. They are actually being generous. They had been giving um, money to Paul to help him in his um, spreading of the gospel. And he was actually saying to them, continue to do what you're doing because you are looking out for those that are around you. You are not focusing on yourself, but you're actually focusing on what is happening around you. And so he was telling them to stay strong, to keep doing that and to remain in the Lord and have joy. <clears throat> But I think about our culture today and I think I'm not sure that we're all too different overall. Sure, we may not have the same um, hierarchical status. We know that there are some people that are more wealthy than others, like when no one's denying that. Um, and we don't have those same kind of relationships. But I do think that there's still this idea perhaps that I should look after myself and do whatever is going to serve me best. Um, and I think that, you know, if we think about our culture in general, if we think about the world, it has a very different view on how we should view ourselves, how we should view our choices, how we should view our life, than what God does. Yep. All we need to do is look at advertisements, look at billboards, uh, look at the media, look at the messages that celebrities are, you know, selling us. Uh, even look at song lyrics, that's a really interesting exercise to do if you want to go do that. Um, there are so many messages out there and they're all selling the same thing. This whole idea about you. You do you, you're good enough, you deserve it, like you follow your dreams, um, you follow your heart, you do what's best for you. And they actually have a name for this. It's called expressive individualism. And it can look like someone following their own dreams and desires for whatever it is that they want at that immediate time. And it can look like someone who maybe wants to advance their career or social status, which, by the way, isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, when you do it at the cost of every single person in your life, that's when it's not a good thing. When you do it at the cost of your family, when you do it at the cost of your work colleagues, when you do it at the cost of your relationship with God, when you do it at the cost of all of these other things, that's when this is not okay. You know, expressive individualism would tell you to look in at yourself, to look in at your own desires, and then look around to see how you can express yourself to other people. What is it about you that makes you unique and how can you show everyone else um, about who you are? And then once you've done that, you might then think, okay, I'm, I'll add some form of spiritual elements. That would be kind of be like the last step. And so you might try and tack God onto the, the end of that or you might not even look for, you know, the God that we serve. You might try and find some other kind of spiritual angle to kind of add to your life. But as Christians... We would say that we would look up first to God, the one who is our creator. He's our father. He's the only one who can truly define our identity. He's the only one who can truly tell us who we really are. And then once we've looked up to God, then we can look in to see, okay, well, how has God made me? What is my purpose? What is it that I have been called to do? And then once we do that, then we look out. And once we look out, we're not looking out to say, oh, look how good I am. It's not about that at all. When we look out, we're actually saying, how can I serve the community around me? How can I serve others? How can I show others this Jesus who I have a relationship with, who has completely transformed and changed my life? When people look inwards to find themselves, they're actually searching for something 
that we're never going to be able to find by ourselves. We're not designed that way. And I think that this is actually a work of the enemy that he has on this generation at the moment. The, today's culture would tell us that by doing this, it's actually freeing. <laughs> that we would actually be free by expressing whoever it is that we are, but it's actually a lie. Because when you're looking at yourself, what are you going to find there? You're going to find your accomplishments, the things that you've done, the job that you have, the, I don't know, your, your work title, I don't know, how much money you're earning. I don't know, like, what are you actually going to find? And when you find that, like, I guess that's okay if you're feeling pretty good at that moment in time, but what if you're not feeling happy with where you are right now? Like, you're going to feel pretty demoralised at that point. Um, what if you're looking for work or you're struggling financially or you're struggling in your relationships? Like, you're not going to be feeling very good about yourself if all you're doing is looking inwardly at yourself. Perhaps the enemy might start to tell you that you're worthless, that you're not worth anything. And we know that that is a lie as well because we are created in the image of our God and he loves us more than we could ever know. He actually loves us so much that Jesus went to the cross and died for us so that we could have relationship with him. And you know what? He looks on us and he, lo he just loves us for who we are. He loves us for who we are, but he doesn't want to leave us where we are. He wants to change us. He wants to work on us from the inside out. He wants to see us live in wholeness. He wants to see us live with joy. You know, those of you maybe that have been on this journey, maybe you've, you've found yourself in this position before, you will know that when you go searching in all of these other places, when you go searching within once you find Jesus, you know that you found the one thing that could fill that void. He's the only thing that you knew that was ever going to actually fill that space that you're trying to find anywhere else. He's the only one that can add value to you. <clears throat> you know, true freedom comes through the knowledge of who we are in Jesus. You know, we read in 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, Where the Spirit is, there is freedom. You know, you're not going to find freedom from expressing yourself. You're going to find freedom in your relationship with God. You're going to find freedom from your relationship with Jesus. And I think, you know, once we find our identity in who God says that we are, that's when we're going to find true joy. You know, one of the reasons why this is so important is because of what it's doing in our next generation. You know, as a mum, I think, like, you know, I care about our kids so much. And as a teacher, um, you know, I've been working with teenagers for many, many years, and I see them struggling. You know, we have generations of people who are st struggling in their identity, who are struggling with their mental health, and they're searching to find their place. Our young people are full of depression and anxiety. They're lacking joy. And I think to myself, like, why is this? Like, is it social media? Like, do we just, do we just kind of, like, round that all up and just put it all in the social media basket? I don't know. Like, I actually, I don't have the answers for all of these questions. But what I would say is that it's not due to a lack of connection because we would have to say that we are the most connected generations ever. You know, we, we are so connected and, yes, we have almost like this epidemic of loneliness that is sweeping our young people. Maybe not even our young people, just people in general. You know, our teens are experiencing high levels of anxiety despite being connected online. They're struggling to connect and they're struggling to fit in socially. And I kind of think, like, I don't know if this is an actual term or I made it up, um, but I kind of think about them being like the Google generation. And I think about that because I think about our own kids. Like, so our eldest is 13, he's almost 14. And I think if he needs to know anything, actually all of our kids, if they need to know anything, like Google is their source of information. They go, oh, just Google it. Like if you've got a question, they're like, oh, mum, can you just Google this? Or mum, can I have your phone so I can? And I'm like, what do you want your phone for? They're like, oh, I just want to Google such and such. Like it could literally be anything. You know, like if they want to know something, they're not pulling out an encyclopedia like I used to have to do. And you know, like once we got past the paper encyclopedias, I used to get a CD-ROM and put it in the computer and I thought that was pretty cool. And now, like they can literally just search it up on their phone and I'm like, 
oh gosh, like if only I had that when I was younger. You know, like if they want to call someone, like they're not getting a phone book out, they're going, you know, straight to Google. They want to know how to get from here to the city. They're not getting out the mailways. They're getting out Google. Like everything is, you know, one touch away. They are so connected to everything. If they want to buy something, you can research it all before you go to the shops. You don't even have to go to the shops. Like you can literally order everything you want from your lounge room and it will get delivered to you by somebody else. Um, you know, like if you want to contact someone, like you can do it. I mean, there are so many different ways. Like you can text, you can email, you can direct message someone from oh, like pick an app. Like any app you want just about, like you can send a message to someone. You can send TikToks, you can Snapchat, like whatever you want to do. Like there is a way that you can get connected to someone if you would like. Gone are the days where you finish school at 3.30 and then you go home to your house and you don't speak to any of your friends until you see them the next day. Unless you're really lucky and one of your parents says, yes, you can make a phone call um, on your home phone, which is attached to the wall, people, those of you that are old enough to remember those. Um, unless your parents say you can do that, you, there is no contact until you actually attend school the next day. You know, the problem is, because we are so connected, too many people are comparing themselves to others on these social media platforms. They feel like they're falling short because what they're looking at is like this ideal picture of the perfect world. And they're not measuring up. I mean, like, how can you? And in the same process of doing that, they're then trying to do the same thing. And what's happening is people are losing their own identity too because they're trying to portray themselves as this, I don't know, perfect person. I don't even know what that is. But they're trying to portray themselves on this online world in one way. And then they're like going, I don't even know who I am anymore. So they're trying to live up to one standard. They're also then trying to portray themselves as something else. No wonder people are getting confused at who they are. And at the end of the day, it's because they're just not content with what they have. And they're unsure of who they really are. You know, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Pursuit of Joy, he says this. He says, The very nature of joy makes nonsense out of our common distinction between having and wanting. You know, if you have joy and it's found in the right place, you don't care about what you can have. You don't care about what you want. Like, you're not chasing after those things because you already have everything that you need. You know, when our identity is secure in God, we have true joy. And our concern is not about what we can get. C.S. Lewis in his book, later on, he says, I sometimes wonder whether all pleasures are not substitutes for joy. Jim Carrey said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. I'll say it again. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. And I think that I have never, ever agreed with Jim Carrey more than I have in that one statement because I just think that is so true. I think like we're all trying to chase after this thing, whatever it is. And he's saying, you know, once you find it, you're going to realise that it's actually not fulfilling what you think is missing in the first place. Our culture is trying to sell us a counterfeit to what can only be truly found in Jesus. And some people are looking for it by any means necessary. Some people look for it in relationships. Some people look for it in alcohol. Some people look for it in drugs or gambling or, or whatever it is. Like insert whatever you like into that statement. They're just trying to fill a hole that can only be filled by Jesus. You know, just like Isaac on that ride, you know, he was all filled with joy and happiness in a moment. Like he was, he was riding the emotions while he was on that ride. But then as soon as he got off, that joy, it quickly evaporated. You know, we need to stop trying to fill a void that only Jesus can fill. There is no substitute for the real joy that comes from knowing that our salvation is secure that we have an eternal life to look forward to after this one. 
And I think this is why Paul could say that he counts it all joy when he faced trials of various kinds. We also read in Hebrews 12 too of Jesus, it said that Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And I think about that and I'm like, how is it that Jesus can look at the cross and have joy? Like, how could he have joy? He knew the horrible death that was coming on the cross. He knew the shame that was attached with the death on the cross. How is it that Jesus could look at that with joy? Look, we know that he didn't want to go to the cross and he did want to go to the cross. Like, it was like one of those weird things where you don't want to do something, but you do want to do it at the same time. Um, And we know that because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's saying, if there is any other way, Lord... But he knew that that was what needed to happen. And I think, I think you know, the, the way that Jesus was able to look at the cross with joy is because he knew what the outcome was. He knew that through the cross it meant that he could have a relationship with you. He could have a relationship with me. It meant that the separation that we had between us and God was going to be gone forever that we could come to him freely, that we could have forgiveness for our sins, that he would then be able to look upon us and see his righteousness placed upon us once we have a relationship with him. He knew that that was what was waiting on the other side of the cross and that is why he could look at it with joy. He knew that it was a hard time that was coming, but he could still look ahead with joy. You know, I think joy is an is such an important part of our walk with God. You know, our relationship with Jesus should cause us to be filled with joy. It should move us. It should call us to action. It should cause us to do something more. So I think it should compel us to share the gospel with those around us. You know, joy is more than just having the absence of trials and tribulation and trouble and difficulties and sickness and financial problems and relationship issues and anything else that you might be facing today. And, you know, I want our kids to have this joy that never leaves. Because when they do, they're not going to be drawn into depression. They're not going to be drawn into anxiety. You know, they're they're not going to be looking for short-term solutions. You know, parents, future parents, all of us, we need to learn the secret that Paul learned, how to have joy even when our circumstances suck, even when things around us don't look like they're going well. Because this is what's going to future-proof our next generation. When, we, when we're parents and we're able to live out of this conviction, out of this space, then we're going to be able to model it to the next generation and help them to live with joy in every circumstance. You know, because we want to enjoy life, right? Like we don't want to just endure it. And God wants us to enjoy life and not just endure it too. And sometimes that means we need to take a position of joy just the same as Paul did, even when our circumstances tell us that we should be feeling otherwise. Let's not be people who ride the roller coaster of life and let our joy be taken when things don't seem to go our way. Let's be people who stand firm in our relationship with Jesus, submit everything to Him and keep our eyes fixed on eternity and praise Him in times when things look really tough, when we praise Him, when things look like they're not going right, when we do that, then we can have this joy that Paul is talking about. You know, I'm going to invite you all to stand. We're going to take some time, and I'd like to pray with a couple of groups of people. And the first group of people I'd love to pray with are those of you that are here today or watching uh, online who would say that you don't currently have a relationship with Jesus. You know, you've been hearing a lot about this joy that we can have that comes through having a relationship with Jesus, that goes against everything that we should be feeling in the natural. 
And the only way that we can have that is because that we have a future focus. We know that we have this relationship with Jesus that is never going to go. We know that we are made whole because of everything that Jesus has done, that he loves us, that he went to the cross and died for us because he wanted a relationship with you. And so I just invite you, if you're here today and you say, look, I'm, I'm lacking joy and I've been looking for it everywhere else and I can't find it. But I'm here today and there is something different. I feel there's something different in here. That difference, that difference is God. You know, he's here today. He's in this room. The Spirit is here. And Jesus, he wants to come. He wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to make you new. He wants you to have joy in every circumstance. And so if that is you today with every eye closed, just invite you. Why don't you just raise your hand up right now? And I'd love to pray with you. If that is you and you're saying, yep, I want to make a decision right now to follow Jesus. I need to have joy in my life. I don't know him, but I want to accept him as my Lord and Saviour. Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for everything you've done for me. And today I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. I thank you that through you I can have joy because of the relationship that we have together. And I thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. The second group of people that I want to pray for, and maybe those of you that are here and you know you're Christians, but maybe you feel like your joy has been robbed. You know, you just, you just don't feel like things maybe have been going really well for you. You've just really been lacking that joy, but you want it back. Maybe you feel like you've been searching for joy in all the wrong places. And you're saying, you know what, God, I just, I just need to submit everything back to you. I just need to come back to you in this moment to say, hey, God, like I'm handing everything over to you. I can't change the circumstance anyway, but I'm inviting you in to come and work on the inside out. Maybe you just feel like you just need to have more joy in your life. Or you just want to have that. You just want to know that when tough times come, that you're going to have this counterintuitive joy, the, the type of joy that is opposite to how you think you're going to be feeling in the moment, the type of joy that transcends our circumstances, the joy that Paul was talking about, the joy that even Jesus was talking about. You know, if that is you, and I just invite you, just an act of surrender to God, not for me, not for anyone else. Why don't you just lift your hands to heaven? We're going to pray together that God would come and that he would move in your lives. Lord God, I just thank you so much that you love us. Jesus, I thank you that you, you died on the cross for all of us and that through that we can have this eternal perspective, that perspective that can change the way that we view what we're going through right now, God. But Lord, for those maybe that have lost their joy, God, for those of us maybe that just want to experience more joy in our life, Lord, I pray that you'd come and that you would just help us to be able to do that, God. Lord, for those that have been looking for joy in all the wrong places, Lord, would you come and would you just help them to be able to see that you are the only answer. You're the only one that can really um, firm our identity. You're the only one that can truly make us whole. Lord God, I thank you so much that, that you don't leave us where we are, but you want to transform us from the inside out. And God, I thank you that when we have your joy, we have the strength to be able to face the trials that we're going through, God. And so for those maybe that are facing trials at the moment, Lord, would you give them your strength? Would you give them your joy? And God, for those that feel like maybe they've lost joy, Lord, would you return it to them, God? Lord, I thank you so much that that in every season, God, we can have joy, even when we don't necessarily feel like it. We can still have joy. We can still praise you in every single circumstance. And Lord, as we go back into worship, God, Lord, I pray that you would come and that you would minister to our hearts, Lord, and that you would help us to be joyous in every single circumstance. Lord, we just thank you for who you are 
and everything that you have done for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.